All right, guys, it's time for a book review. This is not like the Kafka and the Penal Colony short story analysis because, well, I did that through my editing and such. This is just going to be an off-the-cuff, really off-the-cuff review of none other than Don DeLillo's The Silence. This came out a few weeks ago, I believe, and I was honestly... It came out of the blue for me. I honestly wasn't expecting another Don DeLillo book this year, but I haven't really been paying attention to new releases and novels recently for some reason. I've been doing my own doing my own thing pretty much, but I'm a big Don DeLillo fan. I've read White Noise and I've read Cosmopolis and I've been and I've read parts of Underworld. I need to get back to that novel. I pretty much have most of his books in hardcover. He's a great writer. He's up there with Cormac McCarthy. Thomas Pynchon, Philip Roth, Jose Saramago, some of my all-time favorite aunt novelists, William Faulkner and all that. And um, with The Silence, Don DeLillo is, ta is tackling essentially the end of, I wouldn't say it's the end of the world per se, but it's more of the end of society. Because as you could probably glean from the cover of this and from the title, this novel is about technology failing, like cell phones, television, satellites, all that kind of stuff. The stuff that we as humans take for granted and we're essentially so hooked on in the modern age, they all just flat out die. And with, and we follow essentially two couples. We follow Diane and Max, who are a, a married couple living in Manhattan, and Martin, who is a, who was a student of Diane in physics. And there's Jim and Tessa, I, I believe her name was. It's been a while. I haven't read it since I finished it a, like a week or so ago. And they're coming to New York to have a dinner party for the Super Bowl. The year is 2022, so this is in the future. And they're essentially, um, Max, Diane, and Martin are essentially waiting to watch the Super Bowl. But then suddenly everything just goes out. And... This is a this is more a philosophical novel than anything else because Don DeLillo, if you know anything about his work and who he is as a writer, he is he's more of a how do I say this? His stories are more conceptually developed more than plots. Plot developed by a plot per se. There are plots to his stories. The, they're very thin in when it comes to like what you're expecting from a plot of a of a novel or something like if you're reading a thriller book or a um or a classic tale or something like that where the plot is is a, is the central element to the story Don DeLillo isn't really like that he's more of a novelist of ideas and of concepts and of themes more than anything else and you can tell that when you read any of his books, like the characters and his stories usually aren't don't speak to each other like normal people would. They're more kind of embedded in their own little realities or in their own little in their own minds and what they are what they focus on on the daily. And they essentially speak to each other in what they're termed of their language. I can tell that uh, Don DeLillo was a big fan, is a big fan of Wittgenstein because Wittgenstein developed the whole idea of language games and how we, when we communicate with each other, we have to work within a language game that we understand. We have to speak with certain concepts we all are aware of. And if we don't speak in terms like that, it causes dissonance because the way he came about it in his Traticus Logicus is that when people talk in a, at the basic, at the basic way we interpret words is through images in our heads and how it inter and how we interpret it. So if one person says like, oh, I believe um, I met a girl last night. She was really cool. She was nice. In his head, he's thinking, oh, she was just really cool. But in the partner's head, it's like, oh, are you having an affair? Like it's, there's context to why these sort of things happen. It depends on how you're raised, what the culture you live in it kind of pr pushes around when you have certain ideas and themes. And that's pretty much what the silence is about. Heck, the beginning of it begins with Jim and uh, Tessa on their airplane flight to Manhattan and Jim is obsessed with reading numbers and he's, he's he's obsessed with reading the hours of how long it takes for them to get from Paris to Manhattan and he just keeps repeating it in his head and he keeps looking at the information but of course this is ultimately a criticism and an examination of our 
of the human's propensity to want to be obsessed with information. We're obsessed with wanting to constantly be bombarded with information, whether it be, you know, what on the news, watching news information, talking about politics, whether it be watching a YouTube video of your favorite makeup person doing their makeup, it's information. You constantly are bombarding yourself with information at all costs. And that's essentially kind of the, the plot of his novel, White Noise, which is about humanity's obsession and constant influence and in wanting to be surrounded by white noise, whether it be television, listening to music, you know, all that kind of stuff, you obs you obsess over it. It becomes the noise that becomes the drone of your life that you can't be without it because if you're without it for a little time, there's a dread that comes over you like, oh, white noise is supposed to, is supposed to numb you from the fact that you're gonna die essentially, that in silence, you have to figure out some way to maintain your attention. So that's what the silence is ultimately about because once the electricity goes out and all of their phones die and TV dies, the couple in the house, Max and Diane, um, Max, for the first part of the novel, he's like not even really paying attention to Martin or his wife because he's like imagining in his head like, oh, what's happening in the game? And he starts reenacting what he thinks is happening at the game because he can't see it on the television. So this is his coping mechanism, Max's coping mechanism to to ignore the fact that he can't be watching this on the screen right now and he's so used to it is that he's playing it out in, in front of himself. Whereas Mac, whereas um, Martin and Diane start talking about Albert Einstein and his theory of relativity in his book in 1912, Mac, uh, Martin is talking to Diane about it, giving, him these, giving her these ideas of what he believes is going on in the world, that it's probably a terrorist plot that it's people behind the curtain doing all the shit that's going on. Also, Don DeLillo is a big fan of paranoia. And he is essentially, he tackles that in almost all of his novels. But when he talks about paranoia, it's, it's in regards to the powers that work beyond the curtain, where it comes to terrorism, uh, corporate, corporation influence, and all that kind of stuff. He understands that we're constantly being watched or that we're constantly under the influences of the powers that be and how we have to react to it. But this kind of, I want to get back to the Wittgenstein idea about language games because that is what happens once the story moves along its plot, once the characters are essentially having to deal with the situation that they can't look at their phone now and constantly be on it or to listen to music or to have something to take away their attention for a minute to distract them from the silence of what used to be, what, what we as humans used to be, adapt, what we used to adapt to. Our ancestors did not live with constant noise happening. They didn't constantly live with the fan whirling or even like the fan over here when you want to have the cold on or with the lights or with the phone always on. You always have to have something on to distract your attention. David Foster Wallace spoke about this as well in one of his last, in one of his interviews, he would describe that people aren't capable or, or are afraid of reading because it's a solitary act. Because if you're reading, you have to read with nothing else going on or else you you can't really pay attention to what you're reading. You're not going to grasp every little detail, every little nuance that's in the page. And that's another thing that I really love about this that kind of shows that Don DeLillo is getting to a more atavistic nature of what we're getting in. Because the structure, look at how we formatted the words. Hold on. It looks like he wrote it on a typewriter and they just moved... And they just transpose what he wrote through his typewriter onto the page because he wants to get that feel of like, oh, this wasn't written on a computer. This was written on a typewriter before technology. Essentially, he's getting into the mood, the feeling of how it would be to get back to that state. And I love it how he does that, how he uses that to work with the mood. Because later on in the novel, once... Um, once, uh, Jeff, or not Jeff, Tim, or whatever his name, Jim is his name, Jim and Tessa, once they get to, uh, once they get to Max and Diane's place, the rest of the novel is essentially them in their own heads, most, like, they're in their own heads thinking about, like, their own little languages, what they're, what they're familiar with, because, uh, well, what is her, hold on, I, I'm sorry, I keep forgetting her name, but, um, the girl, uh, I don't know why I keep forgetting her name, even though I just read this recently, Tessa. 
She's a poet. So now that technology is no longer with her, she's constantly having to think about language and poetry of how she would think it. She can't speak it to her husband because he's not interested in that. He doesn't work in that sort of thing. And when he thinks by himself, it's not in that vein. And when Max is thinking, he's thinking like, oh crap, this is just the end, this is the end of the world for us. Like we can't do this because he's so used to technology and, and he's so used to watching what they feed him that now that he doesn't have that access, he just doesn't know what to do. Same with uh, Martin. He eventually starts kind of delving into philosophy like, just look up certain words. He's like, I look up certain words sometimes and I just love the sound of the words. I don't really have to care about the meaning. But this kind of goes back to the whole thing. Like you have, in this world, Don DeLillo understands that we as humans, we are always fixated on paying attention to something. We need our attention to be on something to get us away from the silence of non-communication. And so in this novel, in Don DeLillo's imagination, from how he sees reality, how we're so obsessed and so addicted to technology with iPhones, with constantly wanting to check on like movies or TV shows or listening to music or listening to our favorite, I don't know, YouTuber who's, who just videos themselves like, look what I'm doing in my everyday life, look what I'm doing. He's showing us that we can no longer live vicariously through that. And if the end of the world comes, it's not going to be through a nuclear disaster. It's going to become through our obsession and our and our just drive to want to be to a, essentially ignore our attentions from what from each other through the technology that we consume. There are so many great passages in this novel that um, really kind of show that out through the characters, and I love how. It's all through the written word that he gets this a through across. Whereas he could have made a video about it. No, he's not going to make a video. No, he's going back to something that we've lost as a species. We as humans have lost. We have lost the the uh, craving and also the joy we can get from reading something. Not through our phones, not through our like iPads, but through an actual book. Books have existed hundreds of years, way before we ever had technology. And we used to have to, and that's where we would used to get our entertainment, where we put our in attention before technology. And like I said, there's a difference between wanting to actually put your effort in, in watching videos. Because when you're watching something on YouTube or Netflix or something, your attention, you don't really have to, you can just have it on in the background and it's just keeping you at, at level. You're, you don't have to think about what's going on. But when it comes to reading, you're going to have to give it your full, unadulterated attention to understand what's happening, to follow threads of thought that can get really complicated. And that's something I think we as a society have lost, as, as, as a people, as humans. We have lost the ability to sit down, have nothing on, and just read a good book, and just sit there and just ingest it and let it take over us and let it lead us to where it needs to go. Because, as a matter of fact, when I read this... I told myself, I'm not going to look at my phone. I'm going to set it aside. I'm going to turn it off. I'm going to put it away from me. I'm not going to be distracted. When I read this book, I'm going to read it in one sitting and I'm going to do it and I'm going to give it my full unadulterated attention. And I totally got it. As a matter of fact, I felt I was shaking by the time the novel ended because this is not a happy ending for humanity. This is bleak as hell. All the main characters are off in their own little... They're in the same apartment building. They're not talking to each other. They're in their own heads, thinking about their own, like... What, they're so, what they were used to before, like what their jobs were, who they are as people. And they have to cope with the fact that they can no longer be distracted by technology. And there's always... There's this one phrase that Don DeLillo uses throughout the novel... And it's usually in reference to, to Max, the husband of Diane. It's because he was the guy who wanted to watch the Super Bowl and he started reenacting it to kind of cope with it. And the phrase is this, then he stares into the blank screen. This is essentially him saying that even, if, even though the screen is blank, Max cannot take his attention away from it. As a matter of fact, Max is constantly wondering, like, oh, maybe it's going to turn on soon. Maybe if I sit here and just have a drink of bourbon and just relax and maybe just 
chill, maybe it'll turn on. And he just keeps staring at the blank screen. It's utterly futile. The end of the world and the society is not coming with war people. It's coming with the end of technology. If technology were to end like how he describes it in this, who knows what it will happen. Like this is his idea of what will happen, that we will be so taken aback from it that we won't be able to even function. We won't even function together. We're just going to just stare at our screens, hoping it's going to come back on. We're not going to be paying attention to others. And if we are, it's going to be about, it's going to be chaotic and be about conspiracy theories. Like, oh, maybe this happened. Maybe that happened. That's what uh, one of the characters does in this novel. Uh, Martin, he's the one who does that. And he's contemplating all the stuff from what he knows. And it's just crazy, people. I would recommend you read The Silence by Don DeLillo. It is absolutely, it's prescient. It's haunting. It's beautifully written. It was like he understands human the human psyche and and what we're dealing with as a as a people at this point in history that's the thing about don delillo that a lot of critics love about him and they'll usually say about him they'll say that he's like he's essentially like a sage or a prophet of the times he he knows how to interpret how we're getting along in our time frame of what we're doing and how we're adapting to advances in science technology ideas and such and he just he's he's like a surgical he's like a doctor who can surgically with such surgical precision show what we're dealing with and what will happen if we lose it this is a master novel it had me it had me shaking by the time i finished it there's only one other novel i've read in which i was literally like like paranoid and shaking and i just couldn't i don't know how i would I didn't know what to do with it afterwards. Like, I honestly didn't know what to do. The other novel I've read that had me like that was Thomas Pynchon's The Crying of Lot 49. And if any of you have read that book or have heard of it, you'll know exactly why. <laughs> what, what, why I would have been like that after reading that novel. Because it's kind of... Just read The Crying of Lot 49 to kind of get what I mean by that. Because it's just... It's a roller coaster. But like I said, Don DeLillo's The Silence. Pick it up. Read it. Try to read it with no technology around you. Try to take a break from your from being on social media while reading it. It's going to throw you for a loop. The experience of reading the written word versus having all this noise around you to distract you. It's a feeling of utter awe and just it's 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 indescribable people. And I hope you enjoyed this video.